Perspectivas Latinas, a community service of CAN TV. I'm your host, Juan Carlos Hernandez. The social service agency, La Familia Unida, is working to serve Latinos in Chicago's Little Village neighborhood, with a focus on several areas in mental health care. Here to talk about their work, accomplishments, and goals, we have Wanda Avila and Jose Luis Avila. Welcome. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Well, let's start by talking about uh, the history of La Familia Unida and how it came to be and how you became involved in it. Uh, Jose Luis or Wanda? <laughs> Okay, I um, came in 1990 to Chicago. From where? Uh, from Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was an accident that I came here. But we can talk about that another day. <laughs> but anyway. For, some oh, for a lot of people, it's an accident, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> right, <laughs> right. And I never forget, uh, one day I was uh, walking down Cermac and towards Sacramento Boulevard. And um, I saw one car going um, the opposite way and one guy running after the car shooting. And I just stood there thinking they were filming a movie. <laughs> because I never thought that violence existed here in Chicago. So uh, uh, after a few minutes, I realized that uh, it was violence. Thank God nothing happened. But through time, I noticed that there was a lot of violence, not only in the streets, but in the, ho in the homes. Um, I used to work in a parish and visit a lot of families. So I found out all the kind of problems that exist in the family. And then I started thinking, how could we do something to help our, our people? And eventually I met Wanda, and she was raised in the neighborhood. And we started talking about what we could do. And eventually we came up with the idea to start an agency in which we could provide social services. So in 1995 is when we started meeting people, professionals, to see who could we design and start the program. And we started in the ex-campus of Aulet uh, Tepeyac, and it, it was um, volunteer services just to provide counseling. You were volunteering. Right. Wow. We, we provided, among the five people that we were there, about 25, 30 hours a week on Saturday, Friday and Saturdays. But until 1999 is when we decided to uh, increase the time we were spending there. And in 2000, uh, we became full-time with uh, developing all the, not all, but most of the services, which was parenting education, uh, general counseling, and uh, the domestic violence program for perpetrators. And eventually, mm -hmm. based on the need uh, we opened a program for perpetrators for women of domestic violence and an anger management program. Okay, so uh, what I'm curious about, and I think um, our viewers sometimes are curious about as well, is during those home visits, um, when before, or I guess the roots of La Familia Unida, what did you see in the community that um, made you want to do more? Uh, because a lot of us, I think, myself included, or I think, most of us in the community would say, wow, we see problems, we see issues, and we say, well, w what can I do? Instead of actually doing something, we ask ourselves, and we just kind of throw our hands up in the air without really doing more. What, what during those home visits did you see that motivated you to want to do more, to actually want to start an organization? Well, for me, since I grew up in, in Little Village, in that area of Little Village, which is around the Mount Marshall Square area, mm -hmm. always lacked resources or connection to, to resources. Um, meaning, what I mean is, is knowing that m my problem is something I can actually get help for. Um, and that was, to me, when I was growing up and realized how many issues were on Sir Mac Road, the, the, you know, across the street from La Familia Unida is where I grew up. And I realized how many issues of, you know, family violence, gang violence, alcoholism, drug use, and just plain lack of motivation for a lot of the children and youth in the area. And some of my earlier experiences were also of people saying, well, this, you know, really accepting things as regular. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way life is. That's the way things are. Mm -hmm. 
or because of religious you know, connections saying this is the cross I have to carry um, you know and they would only probably go to a priest or a pastor to talk about their problems um, and then and then still not feel resolve um, so there was a lot of taboo issues uh, for a lot of the, the people in the community and it's also a revolving door for immigrants that area so you have some people born there and a lot of people who are coming in from Mexico and other countries uh, mostly Mexico mm -hmm. and so when you have the ideas of you know oh, I'm alone here I don't really have any help what will happen to me if I do look for help am I gonna get deported or I'm gonna have more problems I don't want anybody to know what's going on in my life so the perspective we uh, well I took was you know if we have this resource and the gift of 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 social services to be able to provide it in um, in Spanish in the person's native language or in Spanglish for some people right. that's important English and Spanish and also with a multicultural understanding of the service so understanding the person's culture their point of view not being accepting of the problems and saying oh well that's normal right. but being aware that that is a problem and assisting the person and saying okay how can you find resolve that's that's definitely what we started doing I think at the beginning it was a little complicated because we weren't sure where we were gonna go with it <laughs> but right. um, eventually developed programs that had that idea in mind is that okay if, if a family really looks for help you know they're gonna have one perspective of what help is and um, can we do it and I think working with them has been the our strength and during those early days um, you said trying to figure out what services specifically to provide what were the first programs you offered to the community what do, or were they a response to the, with the greatest needs or um, simply something that you saw a hey, we need to do this what were they yeah the beginning was um, more like we gonna help families to solve the problems whatever they were so that's why we decided to start with counseling and um, a little by little we were getting a better idea of what was needed and families needed a structure needed, parents needed education on how to handle their own problems and their kids problems so we developed that parenting education program um, one of the I think uh, influences that we got was from uh, the other school, school of professional psychology. I studied a master's and a certification in immersion family therapy. And the first class that I attended was about social interest and cooperation. So these two words, I, I knew the words because <laughs> they're in the language, right. but in the context that we were taught and the importance the family need to know these concepts, it was like a new discovery for me because I said if we are able to teach parents these two ideas and implementing in the homes that would be awesome right. so so that's why we developed a parenting education program and, and started working with it now the what we found out many people did not look for help voluntarily we were also working with um, Department of Children and Family Services, the families that are involved. And unfortunately, families looked for help until they were in the system. Later on, we found out the same thing happened with substance abuse in domestic violence. So <clears throat> we started thinking about how then we can intervene these problems so we can create a new, a new society. And we saw two things. One is to intervene to solve the problem from the root. If we saw these gangs on the streets and all uh, adolescents, pregnancies, and stuff like that, uh, there was something else that we didn't see at front. And through the experiences, we saw that there was violence in the family. And women went to look for help because there were a few programs providing help for women, but not for men. And that's what we thought then, that we need to solve this problem from the root and teach these men about the idea of cooperation you know, and including also peace on top of uh, stopping 
that you're so Okay, and that philosophy, those ideas, and uh, in the name you have La Familia Unida. Um, where does that um, idea come from of um, La Familia Unida and, uh, like you're saying, getting to the root of the problem? Um, obviously, women and children tend to be the victims of domestic violence in most cases, and um, men the perpetrators, but why also, people would ask, I, I, I mean, a lot of people would ask, why go and uh, talk to the perpetrators? Why work with them? Um, they should be punished, I think it would be the perspective of, of many people. Uh, what philosophy brought about this, uh, this work of wanting to work with the perpetrators and I guess that philo philosophy of uh, the family united? Well, there's two, there's two parts to that story and I'll start with the understanding of uh, La Familia Unida, our name. Right. And when we first started talking about creating a program of social services, which was first counseling um, in La Villita, we first were, were talking to two groups of you know students and professionals, but it was mostly students uh, who were really interested and sp mostly Spanish-speaking students. I, th I don't think we had any. English. So it was mostly mm -hmm. Spanish-speaking students that were, of course, like us, learning right. psychology and social work in English, right? And then translating every <laughs> all of our concepts into how do you practice this with the people that we want to work with, right? Right. And so when we first started meeting with each other, I think we really wanted to find a name that I think would help us identify with our clients and our clients feel like they're being invited to be who they are, accept themselves for who they are, find an answer to their problems, and be themselves, find, you know, believe in their goals. How are they gonna do that? If many Latino people, and, you know, and then the, the participants that we've worked with have been multicultural, so different, different ethnicities, right. um, is, are very family oriented. The majority of the people who come to us then, and if they feel their family's broken because of the problems they have, they want to find somewhere that's going to invite them to, no matter what their family looks like, one parent, two parents, grandma, grandpa, foster parents, whoever they are, they wanna go somewhere that's gonna invite them to be united and feel uh, that they are somewhere where they belong. So in, a sense so, important. That, so in a sense, that's a response to what you were, that is a response to what you were seeing in the community, what they were asking for and, and needing. Right. Um, for a long time, we were saying our, our name isn't our mission. Our mission is to have a united family, people to feel that they belong where they belong and that they can, they can connect with each other or with who they need to connect with um, because family is so important. Right. Uh, for them, not only the individual, but to, to find that family. And for, for most of our participants, that was a very inviting door. And so I'll let Jose explain the, the second part of working with perpetrators. The, sure. uh, one of the uh, experiences we have had is that not many people want to work with perpetrators. Of domestic of violence. Domestic violence mm -hmm. Because it is believed that they are very aggressive. And that's not a case. There are some cases in which they have used violence in different situations, but um, they're people. And one of the things that we practice first is see them as people. They're human beings that have the right to live well and to be respected, to be loved, accepted. And when we reject them and see them as perpetrators, we perpetrate the violence. We uh, uh, they are perpetrators and now they become victims if we treat them like that. So that's why it's important to see them as human beings capable of learning and contributing to society and their families. And, and that's one of the main approaches that we use in working with, with them. And, and not only with Latino men. In our program we have had people from all over the place. Uh, we are on the belt of, of um, Little Village in um, 
uh, South Lawndale and North Lawndale. Lawndale. Mm -hmm. so, so we received a lot of African American men from the community. And we are very similar regarding our history. Uh, wh when we see the colors, we think that we are so different. But when we start talking about how we brought up, what happened in the past, our history is very similar. And that's when we understand each other. And then uh, we challenge ourselves to stop violence, and we challenge them to stop violence and see how they can start a new beginning that they are the link of the past and the future. So their present is so important. What is it that they would like to transmit for the next generation, which is their children? So in that sense, uh, not only do you fulfill the role of helping these men live differently, I guess in the sense of you're fulfilling the role of being peacemakers, right? Yeah, we see that from that point, yes. yes. We, mm -hmm. we are helping them to have a peaceful life with themselves so they can bring it to their families or relationships. And if, if there's peace in the family, then we're gonna have peace in society. Could you tell me about uh, a family, an individual, uh, a man, you don't have to name anybody, but um, I, I, we wouldn't even know if you made them up or not, but a case that, or a family you worked with that you helped them come through the, uh, a difficult moment of violence or years of violence and maybe help that family find restoration and also that man see himself and his family and those around him differently? Um, for us, I, accountability is key. Whether the family will be re reunited or not, accountability is key. So if, um, a, for example, a participant, um, there's an example of a participant who came for many years, for, I'm, I'm sorry, after many years <laughs> of, of um, having difficulty with his partner and, and children and creating many traumatic situations and also having a history of, of substance abuse. And came to us in a situation where he said, I've lost it all. I've lost it all. And I don't even know if there is a reason for me to, to live, right? He had gone and to that extreme. He's gone wow. he, because he had created this in his own life and, and he didn't recognize it at that point. He said, I lost it, almost like it was taken from him without being accountable for it. And so after coming with us for several months and having moments in which you know, he would get defensive and other moments where he would actually listen and other moments where he started to really participate in the curriculum because we have a curriculum for our, our groups. And he came to the point where he said, I created this, I did this. Whether or not I ever get reunited with my family, I'm the one who did this. And to us, that's super important. It may be simple, and to you, you may be like, ah, you know, or some people might hear it, you know, or, or you know, victims advocates have all the right to say, you know, that's, that's a bunch of, you know, it, 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 that's really okay, but is he really gonna repair what he did? And it might not ever repair what he did, but that he be accountable for it and rec recognize that he did this and he created this and that he stop and not do it again is very important. Now, um, sometimes we keep in contact with participants and sometimes we don't. Um, and we know that successfully finishing the program doesn't mean that you are gonna stop being a controlling person because there are many forms of, of uh, abuse. Right. But it definitely, uh, completing the program successfully, meaning that they were accountable and that they were responsible for coming and learning something and, and um, we evaluated that, you know, because we evaluate our participants monthly. Monthly. So it's not just that, you know, he keeps coming and everything's fine. It's, it's not like that. There is a, definitely a process. It sounds like it's also part of like the 12-step program or something like that, like, like this recovery and this, 
or the rec recovery program where people are having to be accountable for things that they did. Um, am I correct in that uh, right. observation? Right, and, and, it, and we use, in our program, uh, part of that philosophy in which uh, they have to acknowledge what wrong have they done or harm and then see, we challenge them to see if they could repair, if not all, part of what they have done. If there is no other protection, if they live with their partner or have contact with her. And like you said, well, going back to the name of La Familia Unida, you not only work with adults, um, you also work with adults as they work with their children, right? You have the uh, parental workshops, uh, and you also have counseling for children. Tell me about these parental workshops and how they came about and why you feel it's something that's crucial in, in the community. Um, when we don't go to school to be a parent, right? <laughs> Everybody knows that. Right. So uh, when I came in and started studying at the other school, uh, there, there was a, a, a class about parenting. Mm -hmm. And it was very interesting because um, they focus on discipline, but they also focus on tools they need to teach parents. And um, seeing, uh, being in the Catholic Church, I'm, I'm Catholic, and I learned that you got to have in mind all aspects of life and, uh, and or systems that surround you as an individual and how all those parts have influence in your life. So I took it in a different way, and I found out that it's called the holistic perspective of human beings, in which you take a human being and separate all the parts and see how it develops. For example, the physical part, our emotional part, an intellectual part, the social part, the sexual part, spiritual part. So all those components, and, and we designed the program to help parents to understand that a human being which is their children, have all these parts and how they develop from day one, which means when the kid is born until the kid is an adult, and, and how the, the responsibility is to guide this child to have a successful life, whatever it's going to be, not about money, right. and how they can create an extract, structure in which they can provide for all these needs so that the child can grow healthy and as an adult can become very productive. So when we started the program, we have only 10 sessions. Uh, now we have 12 sessions, but we covered 13 topics. Uh, and we included something that we didn't believe was important, but nowadays it's very important, is e economical needs. How a child needs also to learn how to handle money and learn from the beginning. So when right. they go to college, don't start making big mistakes and getting into debt that they later cannot pay. <laughs> right. So uh, that's uh, during these sessions. Are they in? Uh, are they, I'm sorry. Are these sessions available in Spanish and, e and English, Spanglish, or what languages primarily? Um, pretty much in any language <laughs> <laughs> of those three. <laughs> those three. No, so we have we have um, well for purposes of. You know, it's a single language. So if you see, you know, you either have groups in English or in Spanish. Um, sometimes we'll have participants that will choose to do the English that are primarily Spanish speaking. So they'll, they'll themselves, you know, go back and forth with the languages. But mostly it's English or Spanish. Um, and that we pretty much have uh, all of our programs available. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in both, D depending on in the need. In both and Spanglish. Right. <laughs> and so depending on the need, for example, like the counseling program, if you have a family mm -hmm. that the parents both speak Spanish only, but all of the children speak English, well, there's a lot of going back and forth. But most of the time, there's communication um, in, the one, in the one language and able to, to be able to concentrate on, you know, and respect those who are in the room that speak the only, their, their language. and. Um, um, that's very important to us. And so we do presentations also in English or Spanish. Sometimes we're asked to do it bilingual, but it, it translating sometimes is time consuming and difficult. Um, and sometimes it's really great when you could just do it in Spanish or just do it in English and right. um, depending on the need. 
um, of the participants. And when we have families like one that is described that the parents don't speak English and the kids don't want to speak Spanish. That was, that was my the, it's, a, it's been a huge problem because mm -hmm. the professionals who don't speak both languages either provide one service to one and not the other. Right. And, uh, and that's a lot of times why they chose us to provide service to the family because then the kids say, I don't want to speak uh, Spanish. Okay, so let's speak in English. So in, somehow they have their own privacy. Mm -hmm. And then the, whatever issue comes related to the parents, then we say it in Spanish so the parent can get engaged. So we work, uh, you have to be multi-talented when you work with families like this. <laughs> right. But uh, it's so effective jumping from one language to another. And I imagine these services are rare, right? Where families can come to an organization and be served in Spanish and English, right? Right. It's not very common, no. Yeah. That's one of the, um, through my experience with this program, um, I've seen that that's one of the greater area of needs for the Latino community is having these services in a language they're comfortable in. Uh, but talking about that, what organizations do you partner with and work with in the community to get the voice out um, about your services and what you do? Yeah, one yeah. is good at it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the networker. <laughs> so we sit on a, a network called the, the Marshall Square Resource Network. Uh, which is of, com of several organizations in the area, um, Latinos Progresando, um, Taller de Jose. Um, uh, we also are connected very much with Mujeres Latinas en Acción. Um, and so, and there, there are several agencies that we talk to on a regular basis. Uh, we also have subcontracts with uh, private agencies that do de uh, de DCFS to have DCFS cases. Um, we also um, ha sit on committees, on one committee for uh, the city regarding domestic violence, another committee for the state. Uh, Jose sits on a committee for partners abuse intervention in, for the state, um, and also for Cook County. So we, and we also um, stay connected to s the local schools uh, like Farragut and a high school and um, Our Lady of Tepeya Grammar School, Spry, uh, Canoon, et cetera. So there are definitely many um, network, much networking that we do to be able to stay connected to the community. Well, we're, we're really out of time. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, and uh, your information will be on our website and obviously on our channel. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perspectivas Latinas is a community service of CAN TV. If your nonprofit organization would like to work with CAN-TV, call 312-738-1400 and ask for nonprofit services. Tune into Perspectivas Latinas for local issues and concerns every Thursday at 8.30 p.m. on CAN-TV 21. I'm Juan Carlos Hernandez. Thank you for joining us.